great to be with you. I have to tell you that not only have Kane and I worked together in various campaigns over Lord knows how many years, but I'm at the NRA because of Kane. Uh, he's really been an influence on me. He's been a mentor to me. Uh, it's been so important to the Second Amendment and to all that you do here in Iowa, both on Second Amendment and other issues. So uh, when Kane said, hey, why don't you come on out to Des Moines, I think I said I'll be right out and, uh, and, and decided to come. Of course, I'm a Midwesterner. I'm a Wisconsin boy, so there's not that much difference. By the way, so he. Uh, and, and we all, we may have we may have been someplace else, but there's part of this, we're all part of the cheesehead uh, conspiracy to take over the universe. Uh, and, uh, and we've been doing fairly well at that uh, in recent years. But it really is a pleasure to be here, particularly now. Uh, I've been on the road a lot during the course of the last few months. I was out to, at a friend of the NRA dinner, and I can say the same thing here. They said, you, you know how happy I am to be here? The alternative was to address uh, students at Harvard or yesterday at Ann Arbor. Uh, so uh, it's great to be among friends. It's great to be among people whose values I share. And it's great to be with folks who don't have to be, have explained to them at every moment why the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Second Amendment, and all of our values are so important. It is incredible to me that as I go around the country, though, we do have to do that, and particularly in Washington. Uh, where so many people just don't seem to get it. Uh, it's interesting to me that part of what uh, part of what we've always been fighting in defending Second Amendment rights has been the cultural division that we have in this country, the cultural wars that broke out in the 70s. I was telling Kane, and most of you know a little bit about the history of the NRA, but I was telling Kane on the way over here, I got a call the other day from Glenn Beck. Uh, and Glenn said, Dave, I need your help. I need your permission to do something. Because I have Ulysses S. Grant's uh, NRA membership card, and I want to make a T-shirt from it. And I think I need your permission. I said, Glenn, that happened a long time ago, uh, and I don't really think you need my permission. But it does remind us a little bit about the origin of the National Weapons Association, which was formed in 1871 after the Civil War. And two of the first presidents of the association were Bill Sheriff and Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, and up until the 1970s, and you've seen this here in Iowa, we didn't really have disputes about the meaning of the Second Amendment. Americans of all political parties and persuasion pretty much understood that the guys that sat down and wrote the Constitution of the Bill of Rights knew what they were talking about. And they thought that the language was actually pretty clear. But when the cultural wars of the late 60s and early 70s broke out in this country, all of a sudden uh, groups emerged saying, well, the Constitution either didn't mean what it seemed to say or it was an old document that really didn't need to be followed anymore. And that just doesn't go to the Second Amendment, it goes to the whole thing. Uh, you remember recently a justice of the Supreme Court went to Europe and said, if, uh, if I were advising a new country on writing a constitution, I wouldn't suggest that they use the United States Constitution as a model because it contains all kinds of anachronistic rights like the Second Amendment. Uh, it reminded me of the fact that uh, these folks don't get it, but others do. About eight or nine years ago, in Moscow, there was a banquet honoring General Kalishnikov. General Kalishnikov, as you'll recall, was the tank driver during the war in Europe and invented the AK-47. He's one of the few, few real heroes that Russia has, because most of their heroes were tainted during that 70 years of uh, misfortune that they underwent. But, but on the occasion of his 85th birthday, they had a big banquet honoring the general in Moscow. And Mr. Putin got up and gave his toast. And when he was finished, General Kalishnikov got up and took his glass of champagne and looked the president in the eye and said, Mr. President, my dream is a country like the United States, governed by men and women, not afraid of an armed populace. And when I'm talking to groups around the country, I say, think about that for a minute. We live in that country. We've lived in that country since its founding. Others can only dream of what we have here. They can only imagine a country as great as ours. And we're not going to let that country be changed. You know, it's interesting because we weathered uh, a battle. And I have to say, on behalf of the NRA, we were, you know, this, in, order to, in order to take advantage of what Michael Bloomberg and the President of the United States and others were trying to do to take advantage of the tragedy that occurred in Connecticut in December. 
they knew that they had to take down the NRA. We became a target, a very personal target. Uh, and as Kane can tell you, uh, you, you can go on the internet, you can find a game called Kill David Keen. And uh, somebody asked me, does this concern you? I said, well, first of all, the people that invented the game and the people that play it don't know anything about firearms, so I'm not particularly <laughs> But the fact is that all of us have been under personal threats and all this sort of thing. Uh, Wayne LaPierre, our executive vice president in particular, because they knew that to take us down, they had to take him down. And so they went after him with everything that they had. Uh, and they've done that. Remember the president's, uh, president's speech on, on uh, firearms and gun control after new time. He postured, he got up and postured himself, positioned himself as the most reasonable man in America. A man with common sense solutions to the problems in front of us. Solutions that would already have been adopted, but for some evil special interest. That would be us. Uh, and he and his spokesman argued that maybe once, maybe once the NRA represented gun owners and people who believe in the Second Amendment. But that was a long time ago, because now they all agree with the president. Everybody wanted what he wants. Uh, and they even came up with bogus polls to show that this was the case. Uh, and they said, don't worry. Uh, this was a message to the Congress, particularly to the Senate, because these guys don't matter. Gun owners don't matter. Uh, everybody wants what the president wants. That was the narrative. And then they tried to drive a wedge <clears throat> between different believers in the Second Amendment. Remember one week it was, you don't need more than three bullets to kill a deer? I've actually usually only needed one. But that's really not the point. They were trying to divide uh, uh, competitive shooters, people who shoot for fun at ranges, hunters, collectors, and the others, and it didn't work. And one of the reasons that the vote in the Senate came out the way it did last week was because that narrative collapsed when people got to look at it on the ground. It collapsed partly because that day, and I remember Mark Shields, who many of you may see on PBS as a commentator, he was on PBS right after that saying that people are leaving the NRA in droves because they're so upset with this organization because they actually support what President Obama wanted to do. That was the night after the Obama speech. That day, was the, in terms of membership, was the greatest day in the history of the National Rifle Association. Before he finished the speech, 58,000 Americans had picked up the phone and called the National Rifle Association. When this current offensive against gun rights began, we had 4 million members. We're now north of 5 million members. People have joined up. Those were the droves. He just, Mark just got the direction wrong. <laughs> and they were joining up because the president's narrative was wrong. He said we, should, we, were, we were no longer representing gun owners, but we were shills, shilling for the firearms industry so they could sell these weapons to innocent Americans. And I looked at it, and Kane knows this because he was our director of government operations. I looked, how much money did we get from the firearms industry and firearms retailers? We do get money from. 4% of our revenues in an average year. And my first response to that was, by golly, if that's what we're doing, they ought to be handing up more money. <laughs> but they don't because we don't represent them. We think it's important that there be gun retailers and gun makers, both for the jobs and because without them, Second Amendment wouldn't mean much if you couldn't buy a gun, couldn't buy firearms, if you couldn't get ammo, as a lot of us are learning right now. But that doesn't mean we represent them. We represent gun owners, not just our 5 million members, but the 40 million people that the Gallup polls say identify with the National Rifle Association. And we represent in our special interest, and our special interest is the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Second Amendment, and it's really that simple.